Happy Friday. It is uh, Friday, October the 30th, 30th, and the full moon is actually tomorrow. Um, I believe in the power of a full moon. And <laughs> welcome to the fireside chat uh, at Kirk County School District. Let me introduce the people in the room. We have our awesome team supporting us. We have Stacy Smith. Curriculum Director and Jason Carr, Communications Director, supporting the show today. <laughs> and I'm high quality operation. I'm joining, I'm joined today by Dr. Joel Hawk, who is the Assistant Superintendent at Kirk County School District. And we have some interesting information for you today. Um, there's the good news is Kirk County School District can remain open. We can stay open. We can continue to bring our high school and middle school kids in. We're bringing them in two days a week in the blue gold hybrid and we have our K-5 staying in. The other good news is this, that there are no cases of COVID in our schools. Really good we, news. We have no staff impacted. We have no students impacted. And I got to be out in the school today showcasing, or I'm sorry, yesterday, showcasing how we are keeping the school safe. The Grand School District came down to visit Crook County School District. They're getting ready to open under the governor's orders. And we made so, sure they were masked up when they were coming. We and didn't, we, kept, we didn't cut we, them any slack. We stayed six feet away from them at all times. Actually more than that actually. So, <laughs> But um, we just want to uh, let you know what's going on and um, answer any questions that may come up and um, hopefully give you some assurance that as we remain open, um, we are taking good care of staff and kids and that, that there's a good plan in place. Yeah. Dr. Hoff, what do you have today? Well, I think I'll just jump into the governor's announcement as that's probably what most people are, are wondering about. So uh, as, as some of you probably saw, or you'll see in the news and on Twitter and on Facebook, um, the governor came out today at 11 o'clock and announced that she uh, is changing the metric system. So as many of you know, we've been under uh, a certain set of rules that dictated whether we were able to open our schools. So we were looking at how many cases were in Crook County each week. And that kind of uh, depended on whether or not we could open and how we could open. Uh, and today, the, the governor announced that she's changing the rules uh, to a certain degree. So that's what we'll spend most of the day talking about. Uh, and I'm sure even after that, community members, families will still have questions. And that's why we're here to help out because uh, like everything, we just got a, essentially a, a, new, a new rule book that, that we're following. And um, so lots of information to give and I can dive right in and show them the major changes or did you wanna talk about that for a little well, bit? Well, I think it's important for people to know, uh, one of the questions that comes up is why are they opening schools now as, mm -hmm. as cases are going up around the state? Uh, there's just been a lot more information come in um, across the world really about what's what's uh, the best thing to do for kids and what are the risks uh, in schools. Um, I found some great research this week uh, that is fresh, hot off of the- Hot off the, fresh off the press, hot off the press. Yes, and it talks about the actual risk to school-aged children. It also talks about the risk for kids across our country, and of course in Oregon, um, of impacts on their health from other things other than COVID. Um, and basically what we're finding is that about 0.1 per 100,000 actually are at risk when they get COVID. Student school-aged kids. Yes. So if you put that into plain language, it's one in a million. Literally one in a million. Literally one in a million kids are at, their risk is, in, is serious mm -hmm. um, when it comes to COVID. Now, the disturbing thing is that there are so many other risks to students, and those are increased when students are out of school. So I think people are really being careful and cautious about taking care of students, taking care of kids. And um, so we are going to see across Oregon schools open. And of course, as you know, Crook County has been open 
and we are not experiencing any increase in illness uh, related to COVID with our kids. Yeah. So, and I think another point to, to that question that I think a lot of people have is why is Oregon changing their metrics now as you know, OHA is coming out with this might've been our highest COVID case day. Um, what they realized is uh, back in August, the Oregon Department of Ed came up with the metric rules and they were actually one of the first states to, to structure the metrics the way they did. And as other states have opened and as other countries have opened, Oregon, when they did a review, found that we were one of the most restrictive metric systems. So what they've done in the new metrics is, is they've raised the levels where um, we're still actually one of the most restrictive, but we're not, we're, we're in the ballpark of, of other states like Washington and California, where we no longer are the most restrictive state in terms of schools being closed. Um, because like you said, you it's, it's about balancing the risk of opening schools with the balance of all those risks of depression and anxiety and mental health and physical health by not having schools open for kids. So that was kind of the main reason they talked about. And I know- Stress, isolation, depression, anxiety, and teens escaping to other um, other unsafe risks yeah. when they are not coming to school regularly. So yeah, I think they looked at all of that and looked at the, um, followed the science they, they said uh, today and that it, the science kind of led them into loosening up the restrictions that they've put on schools, at least with the metric numbers. So we're trying to balance our message to you really too, I think. We are super excited about being able to continue, but we're also cautious about how we um, keep our buildings safe. And I think that's really what we're focused on is stay safe, stay open. Mm -hmm. Those two things are coupled together in Cook County School District. And if anyone's ever wondering, like, what, what are the safety precautions going on in schools? Um, you can go to our website. It's the Operational Blueprint for Reentry. It's a 64-page document. It lays out everything on entry procedures to um, screenings to what lunch looks like. Um, all spacing uh, regulations. So if you're interested and really want to dig into that, um, that is on our website. You can always go and look at what precautionary measures are in place for both students and staff, because um, we want to make sure our staff are safe uh, as well. So I was at one of our schools shortly after opening this, this week, and after students went inside the building, here came one of our staff members, a backpack sprayer on with disinfectant, sprayed all the railing down where the students entered the building, cleaned the door handles off, and then she was on around the corner headed to the next school. Just, it, there's just amazing work going on out there. So, you know, just putting some kudos out to that, the uh, facilities custodial staff, what they're doing is incredible, so. I tell people our schools are the most sanitary, clean, disinfected buildings you will find in, in the county. Um, they are, we have people cleaning them, I mean, pretty much 24-7 around the clock. And I have to say the little grand uh, principals, when they saw, saw the passing of our kids at the high school, and when I say passing, I mean you come out of a class and go to another class, they were just amazed. Kids staying six feet apart, kids masked up. Um, it's cool to have people yeah. come from outside of the community very safely and see our schools and just be like, wow, this is this is something we haven't seen before in terms of how great it is. So, so that's they had a, to schedule ahead with us. We, I mean, we told them all precautions that they had to follow when they came in and they were prepared when they came. I don't want people yeah. to think that we just let outsiders in, but we, we had to uh, make sure that they were healthy and then also that they were staying safe when they came in. But yeah, no. all right, Dr. Hawk, move into the details. Do you wanna see the new, all right, I'm gonna share a, a chart with you guys. Everyone loves a good chart. Uh, Especially you, <laughs> right? Puppets and charts. All right, so um, there's a few layers to the new metrics, but this will kind of get you started at what the new rules and the new numbers are that, that we will follow as a district. So before the new metrics that came out today, um, Crook County was treated the same as Multnomah County, that was treated the same as Lane County, so the metrics weren't different for smaller counties and larger counties, and that's um, something they've fixed now. Where now counties under 30,000 residents, which Kirk County falls into, has a different way to count cases um, than those larger counties like Deschutes County. So 
The rules for Cook County, because we're under 30,000 people, residents, is to have fully on-site uh, K-12, we would have to be below 30 cases. So before, as you know, we were trying to get two cases, three cases. So this allows us to have um, 30 cases. But one change they did is instead of looking at it every week, they're looking at it in two-week chunks. And this aligns with the Center for Disease Control, how they look at it. Where, um, so we can have 30 cases in Crook County over a two-week period. So 15 one week, 15 the next week, or 21 week, 10 the next week, but we have to be um, at 30 uh, or below to be fully on site. And a test positivity rate, um, our county test positivity rate has to be below 5% for two weeks. And that would allow, if we desired, to have full K-12 uh, open. To have um, our current model, our hybrid model, where we have some on-site learning, like K-5 for our elementaries, and then our blue-gold hybrid schedule, uh, in order to continue that model, we're allowed to have up to 45 cases in a two-week window. So uh, that's uh, to continue what we're doing. Um, we want to stay under 45 cases under a two-week window. That's this on-site distance learning phase. If we got up to 40, over 45, between 45 or 60, we would enter what the state's calling the transition phase. And that wouldn't necessarily mean that we would have to um, send kids back to comprehensive distance learning. What that transition phase means is that uh, Dr. Johnson and I, our district staff, our buildings, our nurses, that we would come together and we would look at the cases, we would look at the safety concerns, um, if there was a case in school, if there's a case or, or whether it's contained, that transition phase means that we're collaborating with our health department to make a consideration and a decision on whether, hey, things, things are untraceable, we do need to um, shift back, or hey, things are, uh, this is a contained case or a contained outbreak, schools are safe. But once we're in that trans transition phase, we're communicating with our health department. And then finally, the last, this red zone, um, that's distance learning. So if we get above 60 cases over two weeks, that's when the ODE, when, when we would just say, all right, we, we clearly are higher than we need to be um, for the safety of students and staff, we would uh, send students back to comprehensive distance learning. So two caveats to this. This is just the... Um, these are the stages, these are the rules by the state. Um, Dr. Johnson and I, we talk uh, with our health department um, probably at least every other day, if not every day. And if there were to be a uh, case or something happen in our schools, then we would, we would act accordingly. We wouldn't wait till there's 60. Um, we would make those decisions then um, and do it strategically and targetedly and not just a, a blanket close, but we would work with our health department to make that decision if there was a, um, a, an outbreak or a case in schools. The second kind of caveat to this is one of the um, aspects of the new metrics they rolled out was a designation called safe harbor. Because um, what you'll see, because we as uh, the school district had already transitioned into in-person, we've had our K-3 in in-person um, since the start of the school year, I think this is week four, for our um, four through 12, because we were already in person and the state was um, considering changing these metrics in the last couple week, weeks, they've given us a designation called safe harbor where they know it, uh, the burden it would be if we had shifted students out back into distance learning and then said, oh, new metrics come back in. So they've granted us a safe uh, harbor phase between now and January 4th where we will be continuing to watch, watch the metrics, continuing to um, collaborate with our health department. But they've said, because you're in safe harbor designation, you are able to continue your models until Jan January 4th, um, regardless of the metrics at this point. We're still watching the metrics and collaborating with our health department and making sure things are safe. Uh, but our safe harbor designation means that we are able to tell our families that um, we're gonna be able to continue our model uh, at least through January 4th. And, and once we're meeting the metrics, continue that as well on. So that so is a lot of information it is. in a nutshell. Laura has a question and she said, are we working towards full on site? 
we absolutely are working towards full on site. One of the guidelines right now is that we can have uh, we can have students in and we must accommodate them at with 35 square feet per person. So at the middle school, that building is too small and the way it's the way that it's built, uh, especially some of the classrooms, we cannot accommodate every kid in school full time and give the 35 square feet. So our board is aggressively looking at ways to get more space for middle schoolers. The high school, the problem with the 35 square feet, the kind of the bottleneck or the, the block barrier is around that passing time and the eating uh, space. But we have um, been working on a schedule change. So the high school will stay in uh, the blue gold hybrid until we come up with a, a schedule, which is much more complicated than it sounds to change the schedule because kids have to get credit for yeah. every moment that we're teaching them. So um, we're thinking probably the second semester, uh, we would like to see the kids at the high school in more frequently. And that will require just a little bit of work on our part. Um, it will probably require some advanced planning and heightening of even more heightening of um, perhaps staff and people to clean in between every time a student is interacting with the environment. So yes, Laura, we are pushing that way and it will not be that long. I mean, January is not that far away, but that's, that's when we potentially could have our high school kids back in full time. Um, there's just a lot of good work going on to try to get space for the middle schoolers and we will make that happen as soon as we can. So K-5 is already back full-time yes. every day. Um, yeah, what we're working on is grades 6 through 12. Uh, and we've committed to families, just so people can plan and teachers know, that through quarter two, which I believe goes till January 22nd, we will certainly stay in this blue-gold model. Um, at the beginning of January, we'll start look, talking with principals, staff, and, and seeing what, what options we have after for uh, semester two, quarter three. Um, but we were committing to family 612 that um, we will be in the blue gold schedule through January 22nd. So Laura, um, you have a second question there and there is a, a plan that would, would bring middle schoolers back in full time after um, it would take about until spring break to get the space available for that. So that's kind of in the works and, and the board, the school board is working on that. Um, of course, it takes resources to make that happen. And um, yeah, so I think that's pretty accurate to say not before spring break with middle schoolers. One addition to all of this that I forgot to mention was um, the metrics have changed and but they also updated just some small minor pieces oh, of the, yeah, the right. school guidance. Um, so there will be a few changes in mask and shields. Yes. Um, they came out, I think the governor came out with an order. So we'll be phasing in those changes here in the, in the next week or so. Um, so be looking for that. But the vast majority of, you know, 35 square feet, um, those sort of rules, those still exist. They didn't, they didn't change any of those or loosen up any of those uh, regulations. Because, I mean, it's like we've talked about. Uh, we certainly, we want... Um, families to make the best choice they can for their situation, to stay so, at home, to stay in school, but we're going to make sure our schools are as safe as they possibly can be. So I talked to Leland Bliss uh, yesterday, and we are phasing in um, masks for every person. So shields will phase out and masks. I think we can probably make it happen by late next week. Um, in order for a student to wear a shield, we will, uh, if they have a, have a medical or educational need that, where they need a shield, and this is just, you know, one in a, in a, I mean, not even one in a hundred, there's very few people who can't wear a mask. Um, we are setting up accommodation for that, which would mean there would have to be some kind of an additional barrier to keep the teacher safe and the other kids. So, um, it is, it is true that we do need to phase in masks. Um, I think that we're probably, we did a count and we, we, we think that probably only about 10% of our population, including staff and kids, um, are wearing the shields. 
So there'll be some phasing um, so that we can and can get, uh, you know, we should be able to get up to 99% or so yeah. wearing actual masks. I think it's a less uh, lesser of a deal than we thought it would be. And, and I think it was uh, Kurt Sloper like, said, about, yeah. he's like, oh, about 90% of kids wear, wear face masks. More um, people are just finding the appeal of the mask. It's um, kind of a fashion thing or, I don't know. People are becoming more comfortable with it as we move forward. I always felt I looked a little dorkier in a shield than a mask. Depends on the mask. It's, it's, true. it's true, I can look pretty dorky in a mask too. <laughs> you know, the, well, I don't have them in here anymore, but the big helmet ones that we started with. Yeah, that was like we were going into surgery. Yeah, those can give you a headache. We could weld in those, we said. All right, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, and I will say that people, our staff, are they're being very attentive to kids. If we have students who are um, showing signs of um, stress and they do need more staff attention, there's ways that we can accommodate them. Um, at our high, uh, high school hybrid campus, Pioneer campus, um, those students are coming in every day um, for a reduced amount of hours. So those, those students uh, will continue to have access to face-to-face -to -face with their teachers every single day. So there's a lot of options out there still. We still work to make sure that we have options and uh, just to be realistic that we can uh, you know, carry out the things that we have on our menu. When we were building it, um, I, I like to, Dr. Hoff loves to eat. I do love to eat. Like and he lot. actually really, I mean, there's some places that he loves to go and uh, he loves burritos. So we were, we were using the uh, term like build your own burrito. Like what do you need in your program? Yeah. Choosing um, your education models, yes, add some yes. sports, add some art. I think yeah. people get it. Like build your own burrito. You it's like Chipotle, choose. you know, you yeah. choose your top, you know, or Tony's top or Subway, yeah. you know, you're choosing your, your meat, yeah. your beans. Yeah. Got to give a plug for Tony's. Yeah. So. All right. Anyway, <laughs> we're getting off track. Don't get me are. started on food. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's it. I, I think there's going to be more and more questions coming in the next week or two as people learn the new metric rules and um, yeah. But it, the the big thing know about Kirk County is we are in that safe harbor designation, um, which uh, should answer a lot of questions. The OD has kind of spelled out what that means. Uh, and one one interesting thing they might want to know. Um, so we've set up a standing meeting with our health department, our school nurses, our principals, our association. Um, every Tuesday, we're going to review the weekly metrics, uh, get a sense of the school uh, health situation. So, so just know that we have, we're building in systems to collaborate with health experts so that we're making the best decisions we can for our, our schools and community and staff and students. And the reason we are inviting numerous people together representing different places in the district and the community is that we can collaborate around that information and find out really what do we need to do to make sure that our school is safe, that we're carrying out all the actions. A lot of things happen every week yeah. and it takes it takes a lot of collaboration to get all the information together. So. Yeah, Jordan, I've got a question. How right. are they supposed to learn sounds? I think Jordan's asking, because I probably saw this late, is if teachers are wearing masks and they're teaching, um, what's it called, phonological awareness, you even, were an elementary even person, phonics, yep. uh, then it, that would be difficult. But I believe, and I'll, I'll double check this, there are um, exceptions written into the guidance that talk about those sort of situations where um, seeing someone's lips, and that's, that's an important aspect of um, children learning speaking and, and reading, I think, at the very elementary level. So I believe there's exceptions built in around that, and we'll make sure those are um, clearly known by our staff on when a face shield would be allowed. So addition 4.0 of the Ready School Safe Learners came out and really just got that this afternoon. We'll have to go through there and figure out um, what's required, but um, there's this just this knife edge that we walk of doing what's best for kids and really if when they when we have to teach them how do we keep that teacher safe and how do we uh, actually provide the opportunity that the child needs in order to learn so we can figure this out mm -hmm. we we have figured out so many things we know so much more than when we started mm -hmm. and 
we can figure it out and we will figure it out. You know what, Laura, that's a great suggestion, having parents in on that and we... Um, weekly, yeah. uh, the weekly metric really review team. Yeah, Laura, we'll, we'll explore that. I love um, that. Because I, I think one of the things is the more voices and diverse perspectives, um, the better. We, we, we try to stay pretty objective with all this stuff. So um, we, we try not to get caught up in any of like the politicalness of it. So it's a very objective meeting looking at the numbers and that sort of thing. But I always think the more voices, the, the Absolutely. better. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just, yeah, I think that's great. And we've had a few parents reach out and ask how they can help. So I yeah. like that idea, actually. Don't know why I didn't think of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, to be, to be continued. This is nice, too. Yes, you are right. I do want to talk to you about that, Judy. Um, so I do you called... want to let people know what the question okay, was. Okay, sorry about so that. that. Yes. So we had a parent or a, a listener say, "Hey, you know what? They changed that. The I think it was it was OHA. a governor executive order yeah. or OHA." So um, immediately, I got a hold of principals and said, "Hey, we're going to have to change the mass. I uh, we got there's these collaborative meetings where um, the Oregon Department of Ed comes on and talks to the superintendents and tells you how to stay compliant. And they said, wait until this new guideline came out and this new edition, and that would be the timeline where they changed from the masks to the, um, I'm sorry, from the shields to the mask. Mm -hmm. So we have been transitioning, for example, in our district office here, we're all wearing masks now. 90% um, of the time, we don't have the shields. We're not using the shields. Um, so yes, you are right that the first order came out and actually now it will be moved into the school. So you'll see those transitions happening. And part of that is, and Judy, it's a really good observation yep. question is different organizations put out different guidance. So that guidance was put out by the Oregon Health Authority where our schools are, um, are guided, directed by the Oregon Department of Ed. So the, those departments talk, but it doesn't always match up. So the Oregon Department of Ed told schools, we will come out with this mask shield guidance and they came out with that today. So that's so, why there was that delay. And Judy's wondering like in this office, so um, Stacy and um, Jason, they are wearing masks right now. Um, and if you watch the governor's um, conference today, they take off when they're at, or you've seen it on different shows, they do take off the, masks when they're yeah. publicizing or whatever you want to yep. say. I mean, I think you're right. We could be wearing masks. It's just really hard to hear. And then, of course, yeah. it validates the purpose of Yeah. And Judy, keep in mind, we have uh, families, listeners, viewers that um, are hearing impaired, uh, that it really helps where they can read lips. And if you uh, watch the governor's press conference today, uh, a doctor who's an expert in this kind of explains the importance of um, people being able to, to see lips and uh, read lips and that sort of thing. And he took off his mask when he was talking. And we listened to the experts. They, they, they said it was I a mean, good we're trying. Yeah. We're not perfect, but we are, you know, and we, you know, personally, just don't take it personally. We're just trying to do the best we can to communicate. But, I mean, it's a valid question to ask. So thank you for that. I don't see any more questions. Nothing on uh, Zoom. I feel like I'm leaning away from you after that question. I'm like, stay over there. We've got a good six, eight feet between we us. We do. I think you have about 10. <laughs> you got 10. I, I heard nine, nine foot's the new six foot. Yeah, that's know? right. But I bet we are nine feet here. Well, you could lay I'll, I'll bring my it? measuring thing next. What's a cow? A cow's about nine feet, right? I don't think a cow's nine feet long. A cow is six feet long. Really? Can you imagine a nine foot cow? I guess it depends on the cow. Maybe I have an expert I can ask about how long. Doug Smith is. would tell us I know. how long a cow I'll is. I'll be now. <laughs> okay, no other questions on the other. All right, any questions? Any more questions? And I mean like an average cow. There's going to be small cows, there's going to be big cows. <laughs> average cow length. If you measured 50 cows, <laughs> what would, what would the average with? be? I'll find out. I think you will. <laughs> From nose to tail. Okay. <laughs> you got to define what we're talking about. That's right. All right. I think that's it. It's Friday. Oh, yeah. Feels good. I am glad it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope that uh, you will 
feel comfortable reaching out to us if you have questions. We have lots of ways to contact us and we love to hear your questions. We'd love to have you participate. It's a pleasure to serve you. Have a great weekend. Take care.